Good afternoon, everybody. The second day of our informal environmental ministerial focused on climate issues. And we have with us today Minister Kiesler, Commissioner Kanyette, Ms. Dubiana from European Climate Foundation, and Mr. Holliday from Royal Tachel. Uh, Mr. Tim Kiesler, the floor is yours. Thank you, dear ladies and gentlemen. Our informal ministerial meeting here in Tallinn continued today in a very serious working atmosphere. We focused on ways forward with international climate negotiations. And we must act decisively because as our Irish colleague insightfully remarked today, nature will not wait on politics. The Paris Agreement serves as a starting point for necessary action. And I believe Commissioner Cagnetta's opening remarks in this morning beautifully sum up today's discussion. The EU is on the right side of history when it comes to fighting climate change. In addition, the world is counting on our leadership and we must forge partnerships with everyone, from major economies to vulnerable countries and non-state actors as well. As we discussed today, one of the key factors for effective climate action is cooperation. Strengthening cooperation with all relevant stakeholders, civil society, the private sector, cities and local communities is essential to achieve our goals. We also heard about the importance of sharing technology solutions. The EU has made remarkable technological progress and want to share our best practices. Today, European businesses hold 40% of the world's patents for renewable energy technologies. In addition, the cost of renewable energy production is now comparable to power generated, to power generated from fossil fuels. The need of investment from fossil fuels the need of investment shift from fossil fuels in power sector was highlighted during discussion. EO, EU also needs to focus on climate diplomacy. It is really a key component and EU should look what to do more here. I would like to thank today's keynote speakers, Mrs. Tubiana, Mr. Holiday, and His Excellency, Mr. Nafo. You have brought necessary insight and perspectives to our discussions. As was stressed by you today, we need to strengthen existing partnerships and broaden the alliance even further. It is essential to keep moving forward on all fronts and involve a broad range of stakeholders, local authorities, civil society, and the business sector. And finally, in June, President Trump announced his intent to withdraw the, the United States from the Paris Agreement. However, there is no reason to feel discouraged because we have witnessed even stronger international and also US domestic support for the Paris Agreement and for global climate action in general. In this regard, we were encouraged by the message from Mr. Holiday, chairman of the Royal Dutch Shell, who stressed that now more than ever, governments and businesses must work together to make a successful transition to sustainable low carbon economy. To sum up, we had a very insightful and strategic discussion on the role of the EU in the global arena. The EU will continue investing in international cooperation in order to support reducing climate-related risks. In 2015, the EU and its member states provided a total of 17.6 billion euros from public budgets for this purpose. No country should be left alone in tackling the consequences of climate change. The EU countries have reaffirmed today that the EU remains a credible and reliable partner for the world. I would like to conclude with an inspiring message from Mr. Holiday. 
we must go fast, we must go far, and we must go together. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Commissioner, the floor is yours. Well, good afternoon to everybody, and let me first thank the Estonian Presidency for the warm welcome here in Tallinn and for the excellent organization of our meetings. Today we focus on climate issues, and discussions cover current international developments on climate change and the European Union implementation of our climate policy and global commitments. We had a very fruitful debate on expectations, opportunities, and uh, potential challenges related to fulfilling the Paris Agreement goals together with the three distinguished representatives from civil society, business, and developing countries standing here with me. Lawrence Tubiana, Jato Holiday, and also Ambassador Nafo from the African Group of Negotiators, who unfortunately had to travel on and could not join us here. With a wealth of knowledge and experience, our guests gave ministers and myself excellent food for thought on the way forward. For the European Union to stay ahead of the curve in the transition and to build from the strength of alliances, it must be attentive and responsive to the view of the stakeholders at large. And it is clear that for Europe to achieve the ambitious goals and make the low-carbon transition, the role of non-state actors, as well as local and regional governing bodies, will be absolutely crucial. Also today, we discuss how the European Union can maintain its global competitiveness, as well as its climate leadership role. The United States administration's intention to withdraw from the Paris Agreement is highly regrettable, but it has also galvanized the international community. In recent weeks, business, civil society, groups, and subnational decision makers all over the world have declared their unwavering commitment to the agreement and they are getting mobilized. The Global Climate Action Summit in September 2018 in California will be a very important milestone in the efforts of states, cities, business, and other subnational and no state actors to curb emissions. And this week, we have seen the announcement of America's Pledge, an initiative to compile all of the climate change fighting commitment of states, cities, business, and universities in one place where they can be easily track and share. Last week, G20 Summit was also a clear proof of the solid international community commitment. The G19 agreed that the Paris Agreement is irreversible and reaffirmed the strong commitment towards swift implementation. And the G20 Hamburg Climate and Energy Action Plan for Growth was also agreed by the G19. The action plan underlines the willingness from major economies to pursue and deliver on the Paris Agreement. But to accelerate the transition, the European Union will strengthen its existing partnerships and six new alliances. One example of this is the European Union-Canada-China joint initiative to convene a ministerial dialogue amongst major developed and developing countries so as to push for convergence and demonstrate resolve at ministerial level on the commitments towards the Paris Agreement. The European Union will continue to work with all international partners to keep up the momentum for implementing the agreement. And the next Global Climate Summit, the November COP23, will be a key moment for taking tangible steps forward, and I look forward to for working with the Estonian Presidency to help make it a success. Euro's experience shows that taking ambitious climate actions pays off economically as well as environmentally. Since 1990, the European Union has reduced its emissions by 24 percent, while its economy has grown by more than 50 percent. And today, the European Union is the most energy efficient large economy in the world, producing for every tonne of energy related CO2 emissions 75 percent more services and goods than the United States. Yet, to make sure we continue to reap the rewards, we must complete the legislative framework for our 2030 climate and energy goals as soon as possible. And the Estonian uh, presidency has a very big responsibility in this endeavor. On emission trading system, after the third trilogue, which took place on Monday, the position of the co-legislators seem to be converging in general on the strengthening of the European Union emission trading system. And the next trilogue is scheduled for the 13th of September 2017. On the effort sharing regulation, once the Council establishes position, the trilogue negotiations will be able to start. I am pleased that the Estonian Presidency is aiming for an agreement at the October Council Environment Meeting. On LULU-CF, Land Use, Land Use Changes and Forestry, the negotiations are also making progress, and the Estonian Presidency aims at having Council discussions in September, also with a view 
reaching an agreement in the October Environment Council meeting. The president is going to be a tough meeting eh, with <laughs> lots of elements in need. And on energy efficiency, I also welcome the Estonian presidency aim to start trials and reach a final agreement on the energy performance and the energy efficiency directive. I appreciate the Estonian intention to give the same level of consideration to all legislative proposals of the Clean Energy Package. I am convinced that the following months will be very successful for the Estonian Presidency and for the European Union. Thank you. And I now give the floor to Ms. Setubian. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm very happy to have had this privilege to, to address <clears throat> the, the Ministers of Environment at this informal council by the invitation of, of, of you, President of the EU. And um, I must say, uh, of course, I'm, I'm coming uh, with all, all what we are living through, uh, the, the withdrawal of uh, US from Paris Agreement, even if we have the President of the United States in Paris today. Uh, he must have left like, by, by, by now. But uh, we, we are in a context where really we are, there is no choice. The EU has to then stand up. And I was absolutely reassured of what I heard along the, the, the meeting, that there was no doubt for any of the countries around the table, that all the countries uh, here, all the ministers were very clear that it was a time for EU to step up and to really um, take in charge the leadership on climate action. So that, for me, was really important. Of course, as a the President say, and Commissioner Kaniete said, of course, we have first to put, not first, but at the same time, put the house in order. And of course, finish what is needed in terms of governance, regulation, <coughs> and hopefully <coughs> overachieving the 2020 targets we decided, or, or we, we proposed in 2009 to see that we can do much better, and we can prepare to do much better for 2030. The second element I feel I, I took back is that um, now EU is ready, but of course it takes, it takes system and, and mechanism and, and in a way a, a, a policy and a politics to, as, to assume this leadership uh, in the international diplomacy scene. <clears throat> we have many tools. We have the, a very uh, capable commission outreaching. We have very vibrant presidency, and that will be again on your shoulders. Um, but, and we have a lot of, of, of member states that can do a lot to ensure that there is really a message coming from the EU towards the emerging countries, China and India in particular, but others, and to the small islands and the more vulnerable countries too. So I think between the necessary coordination we do well, uh, the way we conduct the negotiation, again, we, we have very trained to do that. We need to go a step further. And the step further is one really trying to develop this dialogue that, and I understand, it was really remarkable to, <clears throat> to read the declaration between EU and China. It was last June. Remarkable, more detailed, very progressive. And we need to, this to be really the way EU behave at international level, again, because we have no choice. We have to step up. The, the second element is, so, just go a step further of what we do normally. Um, the second element is the capacity to do and to outreach to progressive coalition of actors. And of course, progressive governments, that's the high ambition coalition base. Uh, but to, together with the uh, local authorities, the states, the mayors, the businesses, the civil society, to get really to create a momentum of climate action. As I say many times, Paris was about having everyone trying to reach, uh, to, to build an agreement, but mainly an exercise between governments supported by uh, economic actors, uh, local authorities, etc. Now it's different. Implementation is all together. And as Chad said, is go far, go fast, go together. And that's an innovative system of, of work together that we have to establish from now. And uh, Europe is at the center of it. We will have the COP in Bonn uh, in November, then the next one in Katowice in 2018. And, and then we, we have to send this message, how we progress on the traditional negotiation track, but how we now create coalition of progressive actors for action. That's why President Macron decided to invite 
uh, in December 2012, a summit of progressive actors, government, but local, local authorities in particular, and businesses, uh, and, and hopefully many NGOs too. And then that we have to go to California, as Miguel Cañete said, and then just uh, make this movement of climate action more and more vibrant and more and more active. And, and finally, I think uh, what, what struck me in the consensus around the table is that everyone understands that it is about deep changes in each country. And that the best way to communicate that it is a, it's valuable, it's op an economic opportunity, a social opportunity as well, is really to, con to convey the message of the work at home. And what better than to demonstrate, to show, to display what are the discussion in each country, this dialogue, this stakeholders dialogue that many are, are really organizing in each of them, and, and see that that, is, that would be the way of having not only government but society embracing this low tr carbon transition. So I'm very reassured to see that enthusiasm around the table, and I'm very trustful that you can really bring a very strong EU to the COP in Bonn and beyond that. Thank you, and Mr. Holliday, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we appreciate greatly uh, the Estonian presidency and the commissioner inviting a voice of business in the room. As I sat and listened to each one of the ministers talk, I became very encouraged. Uh, very encouraged about their determination to lead from an EU perspective, but their determination to actually do. If I had to describe it, I would say they're walking the talk. It's as real as anything as I've ever seen, and my compliments to the leadership that's making this possible. I'm ex also ex encouraged about the cooperation on technology. We believe strongly in Shell that uh, there's new technologies that can help speed this action uh, toward dealing with climate change, and we look forward to cooperating extensively with uh, the EU in, in moving forward. In, in closing and in, in talking about the America, my, my home country, uh, if speaking for Americans, we have never been more committed to the goals of Paris, the enthusiasm that's building, the cooperation that's building now, I'm extremely encouraged by, and don't, don't count America out in making their contribution. Thank you. Thank you. We now have uh, time for some questions. Please state your name, the media you work for, and uh, the, to whom this question is addressed to. Yes. Yes, please. Sven Soivar from uh, Estonian uh, TV3. Uh, question to Mr. Holiday. Uh, President Trump has argued that uh, climate uh, agreement is bad for American companies. Uh, how do you comment that? Is it uh, true in some extent or, uh, or is it totally wrong? The, the, the world is dealing with a environmental and social situation we have never seen before. Climate change is very real. The science is solid. Uh, and, and we have seen that in multiple ways. It would, it's very much in the interest of companies in America and everywhere to quickly deal with climate change so we avoid the worst impacts that will occur if we're anywhere close to two degrees C. So it's by all means in, in the American company's interest to see this climate change dealt with properly. The Paris Agreement, I think, was a major step forward. It's not the end point, but a major step forward. And I give the colleagues here on the panel that were, were so important in making that happen my great compliments. So I think it's good for uh, American companies to be in Paris. And for Shell, we are very supportive of the Paris Agreement. Thank you. Any other questions? <coughs> I'm Nathan Young, Agence Europe. I have uh, uh, some questions. First to Mrs. Uh, Tubiana. Uh, so far, I understand there is no translation into French, isn't it? No, but no, it's okay. It's okay. So far, I understand uh, you want a kind of new partnership with the uh, so, so, uh, civil society. What, um, and I heard that you wanted a European diploma, uh, diplomatic initiative. 
what does your experience as a former uh, French diplomatic representative uh, bring to what you are asking for now? And I just would like to know from one of you, what was the, the main proposal of uh, Ambassador Nafo? Uh, and uh, do you agree? I heard that maybe he proposed to strengthen the partnership between Africa, EU partnership, and India and mm. China. What was the response of the EU ministers and maybe of Mr. Holiday? <clears throat> Thank you for your question. <clears throat> My experience to prepare Paris was that we need a constant discussion in countries on, on the way they see the climate risk and they see their climate action. Is this sort of continuing conversation? And in particular, the capacity to support the progressive actors in each country. There are, there are opponents in every country. That's normal because there are and not only because they are vested interests, because uh, it's a huge transformation. And so for, for some uh, industries, for some economic groups, uh, even for some citizens, it may be frightening to really embark in such a transformation. So we have a really uh, a work to, to do, which is, I think, beyond classical diplomatic track, which is to reach out, again, to understand very well the political economy in each country, and then to see how we can enhance offer space to the ones who are pursuing the same goals. Uh, that seems a little bit abstract, but it is not. And, and uh, uh, when we prepare Paris, we, we put a lot of energy to, together with many other colleagues, uh, other countries, or of course the European Commission, to see uh, who could, how we could open spaces and, and understand the inside discussion. That make our capacity to draft the agreement, to negotiate it, totally different. I think we should continue that. A and again, we don't have now uh, maybe a, um, a, a, a one strong diplomatic network, but we have many. And uh, I, I think uh, we should not, and, and I'm sure, of course, on the French side now, climate is no more the top topic on diplomatic network. Of course, they have other issues. So I think that's why I think we need to regroup and to try to identify who in the, uh, this team Europe can pursue that conversation. And in some cases, some countries, European countries are, are better uh, organized or, or more present. Some others, it will be more the, the EU delegation who is strong. But I think we should now, we, we tried that in many, in particular before Copenhagen and even before Paris, we tried that. But we have to continue that. And, and I'm calling for, uh, I, I don't know exactly how we will end, and it's again not a traditional type of exercise, but I think I'm calling for this. We can't say European leadership and don't have any tools to, to really assume that. So I would be happy to discuss with everyone, certainly Miguel, Kanyet, and others, or with uh, Mrs. Mogherini, to how we, we can use the tools we have. Because we need a strong discussion with China. We need a strong discussion with India. And it cannot be 27 discussion, or 26, or even 15. So that's why I, I think we should change. And I, I think uh, uh, the ambassador said is, he experienced an interesting thing on trilateral discussion between Africa, EU, I suppose it was the European Union, and uh, India, for example. Or, and, and so these sort of trilateral were interesting. And I understand and I know that EU has had a number of bilateral dialogues with the emerging countries. You have one with India, there is one in China. The idea was to incorporate uh, sort of uh, countries impacted by this uh, to the discussion. And I think, it, again, we, we need different formats. We need to have climate as a sort of the normal conversation going on, and again, reaching out to the progressive actors. Mm -hmm. So sorry to be too long for us. something which passionate me. Mm. Yeah, if I might add, uh, Ambassador Narfo represents uh, the African negotiating group. And he declared that the African countries have been uh, 
very strongly working together on implementation of Paris Agreement. And he was uh, uh, impressed how united the EU governments are uh, on this issue. So he offered strong partnership between African and European Union countries and then to involve uh, third parties, uh, either would be India or either would be China or anybody else. That was his message. And uh, the EU uh, ministers were uh, assuring that all kind of alliances, as you mentioned also, all kind of alliances would be of good use in implementing Paris Agreement. And the good proof was that um, uh, Mr. Nafo uh, clearly said that he was impressed that because it was the first time he has, uh, or any uh, representative of Africa was invited uh, to EU ministerial meeting as a partner uh, behind the, the same table. So uh, I believe he got uh, a strong message already uh, through this. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Then thank you, everybody. This concludes our session. Thank you.